Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight at Venture Cafe for another virtual artist studio tour. Uh, my name is Angela McQuillan, and I'm the curator of the Esther Klein Gallery, which is part of the Science Center, which is also home to Venture Cafe. So today we're going to be visiting the studio of Michigan-based artist Jason Ferguson. Um, Jason and I first connected because his work is actually currently installed at the Esther Klein Gallery in a group exhibition called Design and Science, curated by um, Leslie Atzman. Jason originally traveled to Philadelphia for Michigan for the opening of the show, which was actually back in February, so it's been up for a long time due to the pandemic. Much longer than anticipated, but it's been a real treat to be able to spend so much time with Jason's work and also the work of the other artists in the show. Um, so Jason J. Ferguson uses humor, the uncanny, and an absurdist voice to create public interventions, performances, videos, and sculptural objects. He received his BFA from Towson, Univers from Towson University and continued his studies at the University of Delaware, where he completed his MFA in 2006. Ferguson's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and he recently filled two rooms at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit. His artwork has been featured in publications including Sculpture Magazine, Hyperallergic, um, Chicago Art Review, and he has also received awards and grants for his studio work. He was the first ever recipient of the Manifest Grand Jury Prize in 2018. So um, Jason is currently living in the metro Detroit area of Michigan, where he's a professor in the School of Art and Design at Eastern Michigan State University. So I'd now like to welcome our guest, Jason Ferguson. Thank you, Angela. I appreciate it. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Everyone hear me okay? Make yes. sure I'm not speaking into a yeah. void. <laughs> you I never know. You. Um, so uh, I think what we'll do is we're going to kind of hopefully split the talk or the, the presentation into two um, sections. So the first half will be sort of a, a lecture and overview of my process and look at some of my previous um, more ambitious works maybe. And then we'll go from there to a, a walkthrough um, of my studio and the space that I'm in and uh, some of my current uh, projects. So I'm gonna to try to switch to screen sharing here. <clears throat> So it says the host has disabled screen sharing. So I need somebody to turn that on for me. There oh, we yeah, go. It's on. Got it. Yep. And let's see if we can get this to work. Oh, hang on one second. Okay. How does that look? Looks great. Okay, good. Um, so, like I said, I'm gonna do a, a kind of a quick overview, hopefully, probably about 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, so I might speak kind of quickly. I get excited about kind of thinking about these things again. So I'm gonna try not to ramble too much. Um, I consider myself to be an experimental artist. So uh, I never really, get stuck in a specific medium. All of my works are conceptually driven. So uh, the idea will dictate the process and the materials that are used to get to that idea. Um, it often leads to collaboration with uh, people in other disciplines, usually in the sciences, but outside of the arts for sure. And that often uh, leads to the misuse of, of protocol and processes from other disciplines. So over the last 15 years or so, um, I've made some pretty strange works that are a bit diverse. Uh, but again, I, I see these themes running through all of my work. So um, in kind of reflecting on my process, there's this recurrence of the idea of strata and layering, both building up in layers and then passing back down through layers. Um, circles and cycles often comes up in my work as well. So cyclical video with no uh, beginning or end, looping video is something that I respond to as well as performance pieces that seem to go on forever. And then uh, aesthetically, I do use circles uh, often. So you see two examples on the right side of the screen there of circular aesthetic imagery. Process is a big part of, of my focus in my work. I, I tend to think that my, my 
works are embodied in the process, not always the resulting object. Um, so I use process as a form of embodiment, and this will come up again a little bit later in the talk. And then responding to existing objects and their already kind of known um, understanding or purpose and manipulating that through replication, um, sometimes physical manipulation uh, or repetition and repeating and kind of recontextualizing these forms to create new experiences uh, is also something that I focus on. So I'm going to talk about a few of these uh, objects and projects on the screen in a little bit more depth. Um, so this is a good example of working with objects or circumstances that already exist uh, and then physically and contextually kind of manipulating them to create new experiences. So in 2008, I was a, an artist in residence uh, in the Netherlands uh, at an artist residency called Kunst en Kolderfein. And I was really excited to be there. I had actually never been to Europe before. And uh, this is a pretty good example of my, my thought process. So I went there with no preconceptions. Uh, on the train ride from Amsterdam to Kolderfein, uh, which is a few hours, I was looking out of the window and seeing the gridded landscape of Holland and, and really responding to this, um, the fact that most of the country is, is at or under sea level. It has a gridded landscape with these specific uh, fences and then these moats filled with water and square parcels of land with little herds of cattle on each uh, island. So when I got to the residency, my proposal was to kind of select different parts of the Dutch landscape and create one very site specific installation. Uh, collaborating with dairy farmers, I dug my own um, circular islands, filled the moat with water, uh, installed an electric fence, and it was the exact kind of necessary size for a single cow. And then I, I took care of her, her name was Minica. I took care of her for the duration of the exhibition. <clears throat> So that's an example of sort of site specific installation. And this is an example from a few years later in 2010, thinking about cyberspace. So moving from architectural or agricultural space into uh, this sort of infinite uh, cyberspace world. So what I was thinking about with this piece, it's called WikiGod. And um, I was interested in the idea of cyberspace being, like I said, sort of infinite. And when things or ideas or objects move back and forth between the physical world into cyberspace um, or vice versa, there's information that's lost. There's um, a lack of physicality. And this will come up again in my more recent works. But this, like I said, this is about 10, 10 years ago. Um, so the premise for this installation was, okay, so throughout all of humanity, we've sought this um, evidence, some sort of empirical evidence of a higher being. And uh, with my sort of absurdist mindset, I was thinking that, well, we have this, we have access to a whole new um, space, right? The cyberspace world. So maybe there's some sort of empirical proof of a higher being um, somewhere online in the internet. So uh, using Google, which was the number one, one rated search engine, still probably is, <laughs> um, I came to Wikipedia. And then that made me think about, um, you know, Wikipedia is sort of a universal definition. Like they allow you to um, contribute and manipulate it. It's vetted. And then they kind of put it in, uh, in their, uh, their website as like quote unquote fact. So I thought that'd be interesting to play with that idea, this sort of universal understanding of God. So I went to the hypertext behind the site and um, it's infinite, you know, you scroll through it and you don't really get a sense of space. So what I tried to do was I did this sort of, um, sort of like a monk-like transcription of Wikipedia's definition of God, but the, the hypertext behind the site. So I used a typewriter without ink and um, painstakingly over the course of several weeks, um, transcribed the entire code uh, and it's just embossed paper, there's no ink. And then anytime the word God appears in the code, uh, it's illuminated. So it ends up being about 40 feet. When you take this cyberspace definition, the coding and then extract it, it ends up being about 40 feet long. And then 
most commonly I, I manipulate found objects and, and recontextualize them through physical change. So in 2013, I was given um, two rooms at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit uh, to make works related to domesticity. So the exhibition was called Inhabitation. And what I did was I took the first room and built my own room within that space that was about uh, 20 feet deep by about 16 feet wide. And I converted a dinette set into um, a very loud, sonorous carnival ride. So my, my thought here, this is more of a psychological piece, I guess. So I was interested in the idea that these spaces are very intimate, personal, private spaces. You know, these, these rooms within the house and a, din a dining room especially is where you would sit down with family members and exchange stories and discuss your day. So um, taking this very quiet, intimate space and making it uh, sonorous and flashing and a bit overwhelming, I thought that kind of blending the two together, or maybe not even blending, kind of smashing the two together, right, would be kind of an interesting approach. Um, so the hardwood floor has a, a circular hole cut through it and the carnival ride seems to kind of be um, lifted up out of the space. The wallpaper I use has this iridescent layer. It has this patterning across it. And um, as the lights flash on and off, you'll see images around you. And then uh, it also had um, this looping audio uh, track uh, from a band called Detective Brian. There's a, they're a uh, polka band that I contacted and asked if I could use like a 10 second um, segment of one of their songs to loop in this space. And um, it's playing quietly from within the ride. But when you enter the space, what I was interested in most is having a very uh, sort of what seems to be comfortable, familiar, sort of warm space, and then also having it very distancing and um, uncomfortable. So I always look for those kind of liminal lines between liminal spaces between familiar and disturbing, and then try to find um, a subtle medium between the two. So there's just a few images of process here. And then I don't know how loud this is gonna be. I'm gonna turn the volume down. Is that too loud? So this is louder than it would be in this space, but that's the song that I looped. Just that one little segment. It's probably only a few seconds long. The other um, room that I had access to at MOCAD was a, more of a corridor. So it was a very long, narrow space. And uh, what I decided to do for that space was take a, like sort of one of those like ubiquitous sayings like home sweet home or home is where the heart is. They're usually like these little wooden kind of crafty signs in country homes. Uh, they were around a lot when I was growing up. And again, playing off of their, I guess the way that they sort of symbolize or the way that they're supposed to make the person feel. So uh, thinking about these like warm, very short phrases and then making it uncomfortable. So taking this home sweet home and fabricating a 25 foot steel carnival sign um, that flashes at a very irregular rate. It also um, changes patterns. Uh, so at first my thought is that you're going to be, you know, familiar and somewhat comforted and then maybe follow it by nausea almost immediately, right? So it's like this oscillation between um, comfort and discomfort again. So I'm gonna show you a very quick little video clip of that one. And you usually, cut, you had to actually come in from the other side of the space. So all you saw in the beginning was just a, a room with light patterns flashing around the space. And then as you walk around the object, you're hit with the phrasing and then uh, the patterns kind of keep you moving on, kind of push you through the space into the next room. Are there questions there? I see some numbers. Is that questions? Um, there's no questions in the chat. Okay, I saw something at the top here. Maybe it's, oh, it might be just, we're fine. Um, so uh, moving on to some other approaches that I think are, I mean, all of my work I see is just one long exploration of, of uh, sort of existentialist being right like I think that all of them are connected through this thread 
of investigation, but I approach it in lots of different ways. So, you know, I mentioned cycles earlier, uh, specifically speaking about works. Uh, more recently, um, I have explored scientific protocol. Um, and actually, I take that back. It's not even more recently. It, it's kind of in that cycle since, you know, almost 20 years ago, I will come back to this idea of scientific protocol because I'm interested in the way that you could apply it to systems of belief. Um, you know, scientific protocol gives us what we understand to be answers. And if we apply that to something that is faith-based or a system of belief, I thought there'd be some interesting uh, thoughts that maybe come from that interaction. So I've used the scientific protocol to explore my own existence and my understanding of my place in the world um, in two primary ways. So the first way is by exploring the objects and spaces around me. And on the left there is, is a good example of some of the objects um, being disrupted through scientific process. So um, at the top is a short segment from the Visible Human Project where they froze a uh, cadaver in a block of dry ice and then milled him from head to toe in very thin layers uh, to what I guess what I was interested in was that they destroyed the body physically, right? The, the body is ground down to nothing, uh, but now he only exists in this sort of virtual passing through the body. So my thought was that if that can be applied to his physicality, to somehow help us understand existence better than I could apply that to anything. And maybe that would give us some information. So um, I created the visible lamp project, which is the bottom image there. Um, so I made my own uh, apparatus and carried a lamp horizontally through space and then laser levels were placed on the object to give me a straight line. And an eighth inch sliver was cut away, photographed, and then the whole object was moved an eighth of an inch again destroying the lamp and then ultimately giving us a six second video passing through the lamp um, as it was when it was physical. Uh, these other two objects on the right, we'll explore a little bit more. So cross-sectional photography was one thing that I, I used in my work. And then I also started thinking about processes that were more careful and precise uh, they're, they're used for, you know, once living organisms to better understand anatomy or cause of death. Um, so I created the inanimate um, dissection project first, which applied uh, something that you would learn in like a high school biology lesson um, as authentically as possible to something that was never living. Uh, so I did a shoe dissection. Shoe is roughly the size of a, a frog or a fetal pig. Um, and I already sort of understood that process since I went through high school and had to dissect the fetal pig myself. And um, I refreshed my memory a little bit, did some research, and then carefully disassembled a shoe. And what I found that I thought was pretty interesting and, and kind of unexpected was that the value of the object was elevated through process. Um, I think that when we see a scalpel pass through any material, we already have sort of this really weird visceral or gut reaction to seeing that process. Um, and then the care with which I'm disassembling the object and really trying to understand uh, the physicality of the object better um, also somehow elevated the object in a really absurd way. So that was sort of an experiment before I jumped into the larger project. Um, I wanted to do an autopsy of a lazy boy from the get go, but I wanted to start out smaller and see if I was actually interested in that process before I took on a larger endeavor. Um, I don't, I didn't know autopsy. I'd never done post-mortem examination before. Uh, so I knew there was gonna be a lot of research involved. And I was fortunate enough to find uh, Dr. Neves who uh, sort of took me under his wing and allowed me to work on human cadavers with him to learn the process. And then I applied what I learned after a few months uh, to the lazy boy reclining chair uh, this segment is a very short excerpt from something that's about an hour and a half long, uh, but it gives you the general idea of the imagery and the process applied. So, so here I'm, I'm checking the glands. So I follow protocol like to the T, right? So I check the glands and then I proceed after note taking with the sort of universal Y incision, which is shoulder to sternum. 
and that lazy boy doesn't have shoulders or a sternum, but these objects are designed for us, right? Like I think that's why the shoe had so many layers. So since these objects are designed for us, um, scale wise, the, the Y incision worked out pretty well. Uh, the other thing that I didn't anticipate, so the shoe, I had two of them. I did a dry run first, tried it out, tried my camera angles and um, sort of planned that process. I only had one lazy boy, so I had to just sort of go in blindly um, with the, the education I had learned from autopsy on a human being. And what was really nice was that when I get through this process, there are, are layers. Like I was afraid it would just be foam and some wood, maybe some springs or something. But it has um, this really strange thin membrane that was kind of beautiful. And then below that, there is a very kind of fatty, almost gut-like material. Um, and that was all uh, unanticipated. I, I had no idea what was going to be inside. So when I discovered that, I, I took even more care uh, disassembling the object. Uh, I have an assistant who was in medical school helping me out with the disemboweling of the chair. And then at one point there's like a, a Sharpie stain that bled through. So I, I carefully pull, uh, you know, cut that section out and set it aside for biopsy. And I was generally trying to understand uh, what caused the death of this inanimate object or the lack of life um, to connect with it in some way. Uh, and ultimately, you know, I had thought about having the uh, pathophysiologist, Dr. Neves, do the procedure for me. But um, even though he would be much more precise and uh, had been doing that process for years, I decided that with my, my limited education, a few months of working on cadavers with him, uh, I would do it because I had actually convinced myself I was looking for uh, some sort of answer in here. Right? I was really trying to understand uh, what separates my tangible existence from the tangible existence of this inanimate object. So that's exploring, that's some of the projects I did exploring spaces and objects around me. Um, I also apply medical procedures uh, or scientific protocol to my own body to better understand my physicality uh, through exploring those empirical aspects of my existence. So I've done this in a few ways. This, this piece is a superficial um, understanding of my existence, and it's actually called superficial scan. Uh, I was invited to participate in a contemporary approaches to self-portraiture exhibition. And what I wanted, what I started thinking about was what would be the most exact and precise way to identify or to think about identity, uh, identity of myself. Um, but also thinking about that, that kind of vague space that I'm interested in where it's maybe a little bit disorienting. So what I ended up doing was uh, I made this apparatus on the left of your screen that carried a, a carriage about uh, one inch increment passes vertically over my body. And then the camera is carried in 180 degrees in front of me uh, in a kind of a semicircle, and it's a uh, 10 times optical zoom, high definition video um, in that one pass around my body. And then I'll turn and face the wall and we'll do another pass on the back side of my body in that one inch uh, area again. And then we'll lower the apparatus uh, by an inch and do the next layer. So I had video um, that basically covered every inch of my body at 10 times optical zoom and um, high definition. And then those short segments uh, of video were mixed. So the idea was that the video is playing in the space and you are literally seeing every inch of my, my body, right? Head to toe, really close proximity. But the mixing of the video and the proximity of the video turn the body into a sort of a topographical landscape, right? Like you're not ever seeing features, you're just seeing very close details um, and some somewhat grotesque details of the body when you get that close. So I could be standing right next to it and you would never realize or make the connection that that was me. Um, more recently, I've been thinking about a volumetric understanding of the body and then also uh, the substructure and the kind of internal architecture of my body. Uh, so on the top is a piece called um, 
being nothing more. And then the bottom is the nature of being. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about both of these briefly. I'm gonna try to keep it moving here. Um, so the nature of being is a full scale 3D printed replica of my entire skeletal system. And um, the one at the top is the one that Angela was speaking of earlier that is in Philly. Uh, the one at the bottom is behind me in a box. <laughs> Uh, and then I'm here. So there's like three of me uh, existing simultaneously. And um, the, the idea, of, or actually not the idea, I think the idea is pretty straightforward. It's sort of a memento mori, or maybe the ultimate memento mori. And I was much more interested in the process going into it, because I knew I would have to go through um, hundreds, actually thousands of images layer by layer to segment out what was bone from surrounding. Um, so it was really more of a process for me in this sort of internal investigation into my mortality. Um, and I used medical scans from a few different processes to piece it together. So I was fortunate enough to get a grant uh, that allowed me to use University of Michigan's um, research dedicated MRI machine. So this is never for patients. It's purely for research. And it allowed me to I spent about eight hours in that machine, uh, not in two hour increments. And MRIs are not ideal for segmenting bone. They're, um, they, they're kind of muddy, right? So I used what I had. And while I was working with the MRI, I also looked into other options. Uh, they wouldn't allow me to use a spiral CT, which would go right to bone. Uh, but that process is radiation. Uh, and I was relatively young and relatively healthy. So they said no to that. So I had eight hours of MRIs to work with. Um, I collaborated with Northwestern Memorial Hospital and I had an EOS scan, which was able to generate my spine, pelvis and lower limbs. And then I had a, a pretty awful root canal, um, actually right around the time that I was doing this project. And my dentist was nice enough to let me have all of the imagery from my CBCT scan. Uh, and then that combined with, I had a, a CT scan of my skull a, a few years earlier uh, for migraines. So piecing all of those together using simple wear scan IP software uh, allowed me to build models from 2D slices. And then I physically assembled, I'm sorry, I digitally assembled the entire skeleton first, 3D printed each uh, bone and then reassembled it physically after the fact. So the 3D printed skeleton is again sort of a memento mori where it's focused on mortality. Uh, being in nothing more is an attempt to sort of define existence as a limited amount of physical space. So I think about um, philosophy and existentialism a lot. And there's a quote from uh, Jean-Paul Sartre where he's speaking about this idea of, of pure being, true being. Um, and he says that it's being as if you were a rock, being as if you were a tree or a table or a landscape, um, they just are versus our being uh, where we're conscious and aware of our existence. So we'll never achieve true being because we're aware of our own physicality and mortality. Um, so this is sort of a playful way to try to get one step closer to true being uh, by turning myself into a boulder. Um, so the boulder occupies the exact volume of my body at age 38 um, on that day. You can see there's a small rock on the floor. Um, so process wise, I 3D scanned this small rock. Uh, and then I had to find out my volume. And I, I discovered something called a bod pod, um, which is primarily reserved for nutritionists working with athletics. Uh, they track the athlete's body. They try to track changes in the athlete's body. And then that way they can adapt and, and improve their performance. But it also, uh, through um, air pressurization, they, it also allows you to gauge volume. Um, so all I wanted was that one number. You know, I, I convinced them to let me get into this bod pod, and then we pressurized the chamber, and we calculated my volume to be 5,616.188 cubic inches um, on that day. So I took that number and scaled up the 3D scan of the rock to exactly the same volume and then sliced it into layers that were the thickness of the material I was using and milled those individually and then laminated them together to make the boulder. 
And then um, this one might kind of skip a little bit. I'm not sure. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to exhibit this work in Tokyo in, in late 2018. And since I was going there to give a, a talk as well, I, I decided to do sort of a performance piece, uh, sort of Sisyphusian performance piece carrying this boulder that's the volume of my body throughout Tokyo in this harness, sort of custom made harness for the object. It's so pretty too. And coming down to the end painted. here, so, uh, sorry? I just said the way it's painted is so pretty. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I can talk about that a little bit more too. Uh, it's in the next room so we can take a look at it, hopefully if there's time. Um, my most recent work, this is something I'm currently working on where I, I've collaborated with Lance Wynn, who's a, an artist in Delaware. And um, we've been passing ideas and files and imagery back and forth for several years. And this is the first object that we actually finalized um, it's called Distorted Americana, and it's currently stuck in Ohio, <laughs> um, in Cincinnati. But uh, the piece is a, basically Lance used Google Earth and created a, a sort of a rough rendition of Rushmore. And then passing it back and forth, we played around with distortions and, and changing the physicality of the object. Obviously the scale is much different, but also stretching it into space when we discovered that when we pulled it um, to about seven feet long, there's this really kind of beautiful rock formation on the back side of it that's basically pressing, it's the negative of Rushmore's faces pressed through the object. Um, so I milled this in, in my space here using three inch, uh, three pound polystyrene. It's a little bit more dense than the standard polystyrene. And then uh, that was laminated into these sort of strata as well. Um, the last thing, I'm not even going to talk about this too much, but um, I hope to work with Kohler. Uh, they have an artist in residency, or it's Kohler Arts and Industry Program uh, in Sheboygan, uh, Wisconsin. And they're, they're doing some pretty interesting things with artists. They allow them to use their foundry to cast iron, um, or you can do a ceramics residency, which is a, a different one. Uh, but I uh, have been talking back and forth with them, and I hope to be an artist in resident there in 2022 and these are some of my preliminary proposals for using their uh their patterns and their templates from their manufacturing process at kohler for what they make um, to generate these sort of uh strange surreal objects and then the last are, one are those supposed to be like small prototypes that you would make larger at kohler yeah exactly so um so here's a, just a prototype, just trying to visualize what this object might look like physically, but I'd like to make it in cast iron at full scale is the, is the hope. Um, wow. Here's the last one. This is a fire hydrant, which is not something that they make, but something that I, I have to make. Like I'm just really <laughs> excited about this one for some reason. Um, so I've already cut a fire hydrant in half. It's next door as well. Um, so that's the last my last image so I can stop the screen share unless there's any questions um, if you want me to go back. Yeah, does anyone have any questions for Jason? I mean, um, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was wondering if you could, um, there are a couple things that I wasn't sure how the word God was illuminated in the, sure. in the um, hypertext piece. Yeah, the piece. wiki God piece. Yeah. Uh, is illuminated through faith alone. <laughs> no. um, going back to the image. So I had to make a light table basically that aligned um, with every time the word God appeared on the scroll. Um, sorry, it's way back. So this wooden light table, I made that custom for that scroll. And I it's it's got a little kind of clamp built into the table that allows me to unroll it at the exact same length every time. And then when it was unrolled, I plotted out um, onto the table surface everywhere, measuring over from the edge and up from the other edge, made a center mark and then knew the, the size of the word God. Um, so after I plotted them out, I went through and cut each one manually. That was the only way I could do it. And then it has fluorescent lights lining the entire underside of the table. Does that answer your question? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I was also wondering, um, you showed the image of the, um, the volume of your own body mm -hmm. and the kind of performance of walking through the streets of Tokyo with it on your back and um, and then I, but when you were showing the dissection for the video, I was wondering if you've done a lot of performance, like live performance for live performances. these videos as well. Um, no, you know, honestly, I haven't. I, I've definitely thought about it. I did do a typewriter performance that was different from the Wiki God piece um, live, uh, where I started with a typewriter with brand new ink and I slammed the keys and shouted, I exist here now as I typed them, the words. And I did that until the ink ran out, which is several hours of typing. Um, and then it would rip the, the key or the, uh, the letters would rip through the ink because the ink uh, strip would stop. It would get stuck at the end. And then I would keep slamming the same space and uh, eventually it would fade and then it would rip through the, the ink ribbon and just uh, pound the, the keys as embossed paper. And I think that that kind of led to the, to the God piece after the fact. Uh, but other than that, I have never done um, live performances, uh, not, not for the medical procedures, although that would be interesting because they used to do like, like auditorium, right? Like that's how they would learn. The anatomical yeah. theater. <laughs> yeah, exactly. that would be really interesting actually. Yeah. Great. I have, a, well, yeah. I have a question for you. So you, you've mentioned God and like faith-based investigations a lot um, in your work and like trying to discover what this mysterious life force is and kind of what it means when we die. I'm just wondering, can I ask you like, what is your like exposure to religion or your religious background? And like, at what point in your life did you start investigating this through scientific process? <laughs> Um, great question. So um, my mother is Jewish and my dad is Catholic. So I grew up confused. And <laughs> actually, I'm very, I feel very fortunate for that upbringing because it is, it's led to all of this inquiry, right? Like if I, I feel like if I was taught that there was one specific answer, that I wouldn't have all these, these questions that I'm trying to answer through my work. Um, so I, I think I started really thinking about that. Um, when, you know, in grade school, um, I was told by uh, another student that, you know, she leaned over, it was really random, actually, she leaned over and she said, so do you take Jesus as your Lord and Savior? And I said, I don't, I don't think so, because I'd never really heard it phrased that way. And she said, well, then you're going to hell. And I said, am I? So I asked for a Bible for Christmas. I was curious, like what, I felt like I was left out, you know, like I didn't know the answer. So, um, so since that age, I've always been thinking about it. And then um, the scientific stuff happened in, in grad school when I started thinking about, when I started studying some more specific philosophical texts and then seeing overlaps between phenomenology and existentialism and how those process, th those ideologies might somehow meet with scientific protocol, which gives us what we consider to be answers. Um, I thought that'd be an interesting kind of space to be working within. Yeah. I feel like we're all kind of on the search for these answers. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Once I find the answer, I don't, I'm not going to make any more work. So that's going to be problematic. <laughs> then you've solved everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop my video. I'm going to see if I can switch over so I can walk you through before time's up. Sounds good. Oh, actually, we're, I ran through that really quickly, didn't I? Did I? Um, you still oh, have 15 no. minutes. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, all right, let's see, I'm gonna stop that. I'm gonna stop. All right. Can you see me? Oh, oh, sorry. There we go. Yeah, it looks like it's- Is that better? Yeah. Okay. No more feedback. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd just walk you around my space really quickly. And um, so this is a, a small room that I closed off in a much larger space. So I'm, I'm really, uh, I feel very fortunate. I have a, a house in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere. And it came with a, a huge outbuilding that I've kind of converted into my studio. 
So um, really quickly, just walking around. These are some anamorphically distorted skulls from my CT scans. Um, I'm creating an addition of those right now, which is not something that I usually do, but I think uh, the pandemic and forcing me to be in this space in a different mindset, um, I've been thinking about different ways of, of making work. And then um, next door is the larger room. So I make pretty large work. So I was always looking for a space that had, or and we're all like so jealous of this space. space. <laughs> What's that? I said, we're all like super jealous of all this space you have. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm, I, like I said, I feel very fortunate. We, we looked at this house five years ago. Uh, it's a, it's a good drive for me to work about maybe 40 minutes, which isn't, I don't th think that's that bad, but some of my colleagues think I'm crazy. Um, but it came with this building. So uh, I, I couldn't ask for a better space so that I have room to make and store large stuff. And then also, um, you know, I have a, a workspace back here, a small wood shop. And then I've accumulated equipment over the years. All of it was in ruin. Like this CNC machine is 20 years old. Uh, but I got it from a uh, from Lawrence Tech University in Detroit. It was in storage. All the wires were ripped out. It was rusted, and I just restored it. Uh, I got it for a really reasonable price, and then uh, restored it so I could do CNC milling here. Um, my first 3D printer I built myself by printing the parts on uh, the printer at the university, hmm. and that's probably my favorite printer still. It's my most reliable one. That's pretty amazing. I've never What's heard of anyone, I've never heard of someone building a printer from parts they printed. Yeah, um, I mean, so I kind of I've kind of already I think maybe maybe it's clear by now. Like I get obsessed with with ideas and processes, and if I'm going to even consider using something as part of my my artistic practice, I need to learn everything there is to know about it. So I'd never done CAD work before. I'd never done any sort of three D modeling. I'd never done 3D printing and then the school got one and they didn't know what to do with it. So I said, I will figure it out. <laughs> so I put it in my office and then from that, fixing that machine, I learned how to build the parts for my own machine. Um, I'm going to flip it back and show you one piece that I didn't get to talk about in my talk. Um, so this is a pretty good example of replication. You know, a lot of the manip manipulation I talked about earlier um, you know, it's, it's site specific, it's conceptual, but this project was not manipulation, but straight replication. Uh, so I had a solo exhibition in Detroit at a space called Public Pool, and I became obsessed with their entryway to the gallery. It was a little alley uh, that was painted this exact color, and it had this exact strange light, and it had this strange graffiti painting and it had all of these specific markings and leftover tape and leftover flyers. Um, and I became obsessed with it when I was planning my show. So I became so obsessed that I, I made it again um, in my studio by measuring coordinates, you know, measuring off of the object, um, taking paint chips to match the color of paint. Here's the original, the little, image of the real space. And then this is my space. And then this piece was installed inside of the actual space. So when you entered my show there, you went into the normal alleyway and then turned around and you were in the same space a second time, right? So it was a really sort of surreal um, feeling of having just gone through this space and being met with all of the same markings and the same uh, you know, mail slot and functional door. And then you went from there into the actual um, exhibition. Do you know what made you um, obsessed with that space? Um, it's just such a strange and unique space. I wish I had, I should have included an image in my, my video because this is kind of ridiculous holding the phone up to it. But that's the gallery to the left, that window space. And then that's the entry into the gallery. So. Um, it's just very Hamtramck, you know, it's a, it's a um, one of the districts in Detroit, 
And it just had this really interesting feeling to it. And I knew that the people would be going to the show um, were mostly from Hamtramck or that area in Detroit. So it's, it's kind of a signature, like people know of that gallery and going through that same, um, that same sort of iconic space twice was a way for me to kind of create a portal into a, a different mindset in the gallery. It was my, my thought anyway. Right. So, can I ask yeah. what the logistics are with moving a piece like that? Like, did you have to build it? Do you have to disassemble it and rebuild it wherever you go? Or does it just like, you just wheel it out? No, it's, um, so I made it in panels and um, it, it comes apart into, it lays flat basically. Okay. So everything, it, it comes apart as three walls and a top and then a, a door and the floor I had to make because I mean a slab of concrete of that size would have been would have weighed a ton so right. I made the, the, the slabs able to be moved individually and then they would stack up to make this just the correct distance of their ramp. Wow. And then the uh, the carnival ride that one's towed so that's built into a trailer. So that one collapses like carnivals collapse when they transport them and then it's hooked up to a vehicle and towed to the next site and then uh, unfolded for exhibition. And there's the cut hydrant. Oh, wow. But not extruded yet. <laughs> so let me see if I can go back in here now. Switch back, we can see the conversation maybe. Um, okay. Oops. So can I, <laughs> yeah. here you go. Can I ask when you use found objects in your work, like the dinette set or the lazy boy, do you kind of like stumble upon the object and then figure out what to do with it? Or do you have an idea in mind first and then seek out these objects? Yeah, that's a good question too. Um, you know, I think, I think I'll usually make a connection when I see the, an example of the object somewhere, and then I'll seek out the right one for the piece, if that makes sense. So um, I did a piece with a, a bale feeder, which is uh, this sort of steel ring to keep cattle out of their food um, and to prevent fighting over the food. So it has these partitions going around it. Um, so that each cattle uh, or each cow puts their head in and takes their food from their own section. So I did a piece where I lowered a dinette set and made a bale feeder for people. <laughs> um, and so that one was seeing bale feeders, you know, in the field when I was teaching at the University of Idaho and then fabricating my own, seeking the right dinette set and, and going from there. So it's a response, but then it's tweaked throughout the process to find the right lazy boy or the right shoe or, yeah. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting too that like your lazy boy and the shoe have like leather skin, which is kind of human in a way, you right. know? It would have been a very different piece uh, with <laughs> like um, chucks or something like that, right? Yeah, like, exactly, yeah. like canvas or something. Yeah. Um, does anyone have any more questions or comments for Jason? Uh, yeah, Jason, I had a question and sorry if you mentioned this and I just totally missed it, but I was curious about um, the process of collaborating with, you know, some of these people like uh, during the autopsy or measuring uh, your body volume or getting CT, CT scans. Um, how do you like kind of broach that uh, with people and introduce the idea? And all Usually uh, carefully, right? Because they're, they're not used to working with somebody who's thinking about using their process wrong. So, um, so the pathophysiologist uh, had a really interesting conversation with him. You know, I, I found, I was a, a graduate student when I did that piece and I found that we had, um, you know, autopsy taught on campus, reached out to him. He was willing to meet with me and, uh, we had this nice conversation over lunch 
And he said, you know, you really have to see an autopsy table in person. It's like a really cold object. You'll never be the same. But I'd already moved past that. I was building, a, I was fabricating a stainless steel autopsy table in my studio. So I invited him to my studio and it, it kind of blew his mind that I was taking it this far. <laughs> um, and that kind of gave me, a, you know, an entry point, I think. Um, the, the MRI technicians, that was a little bit tougher. I had to go through a lot of red tape and I'd sign a lot of forms and, um, you know, telling them I'm a consenting artist. The biggest and most interesting thing for me with the MRIs was uh, we had a long conversation about what would happen if they saw something in the scans that was bad, right? Like he said, well, what if I see that you have a mass on your liver? Like, what am I supposed to do with that, right? Like. I can't, if I tell you and you're, you don't have symptoms, then you're going to go through financial um, crisis. You're going to potentially have surgery on your body. And maybe none of that would have been necessary because you were asymptomatic, you know? So I had to sign paperwork saying that if they discovered anything, don't tell me. <laughs> um, and of course, as I'm going through layer by layer, I'm analyzing, you know, like, what is that? What's that little white mark, you know? Um, but, uh, that was really interesting. It was also cool because they call it a human phantom. That's what they, they don't, they, they don't give you, it's a de-identified, um, human being. So rather than give you a, a name and have that name carried throughout all of your scans, since it's a research machine, it's just called a, a, a human phantom. So I almost called that project human phantom or something related to that too. Mm. Oh, or the shoe, the shoe and the upholstery piece, were those the only two pieces that were soft? Um, I did a series of chair skin rugs <laughs> as well, um, using taxidermy process. It, I don't show those very often. Like they're beautiful objects and they're huge. They're these, I skinned lazy boys and made pelts, you know, these big stretched out pelts. Um, so those were sort of fibrous projects. You know, I used gabardine and I, I learned how to, to cut and sew the felt to the gabardine and then to the hide. And, um, but beyond that, um, yeah, I don't think that there are any other soft objects. They're mostly rigid. Okay, I, it was just interesting. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So how has the pandemic affected your practice and what are you working on um, that's coming up? Sure. Um, so I've been diving into uh, software more. Software is a big part of what I do anyway, but I've been playing with animations and using Blender. This is something that uh, Lance Wynn, the artist in, in Delaware, and I have been sending back and forth experiments with Blender. Uh, and soft bodies and, and some other ways of thinking about generating imagery. Um, I've also gone to making prototypes and developing proposals for work when uh, we're able to be in the same space with other people again. Um, so I've had to adapt and I've had to adapt with, the, with teaching as well. You know, Eastern went online uh, in March and we were thrown online immediately. So I, I've had to adapt with that process, which led to some works that I, uh, I wasn't anticipating. Uh, I didn't show them in my talk, but I did a series of these sort of little sculptural interventions around my property, just using what I had access to in my home. Uh, Cause I had to think about how to teach students how to think about adapting to no materials and no equipment, but still make meaningful work. Um, so, yeah, I did. I, I maybe it was more productive in those first two weeks than I've been in a long time. I made like twelve pieces, you know. Um, yeah, I'm not a teacher, but I've I've heard from many of my friends who are that teaching has been a very difficult process to adapt to virtually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have a comment, Marjorie? Sorry. Teaching is. Uh, am I on? Oh yeah. So I, I don't want to say much more. <laughs> no, that's okay. Teaching remotely is, I mean, I might as well just shoot myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge for sure. <laughs> yeah. So is the studio you have now, is that where you do most of your work or do you also have a studio at school? No, we, we don't have studios at, at Eastern. So um, yeah, when, when I was looking for a, a, a house, you know, Ann Arbor was kind of out just way too expensive and there wasn't a whole lot of 
like it was all quarter acre. Like I wanted a little bit of room in case I wanted to build. I didn't know I was going to discover this massive building that came with the house. The guy built it as an electric company and it just was part of the deal. Um, it was totally reasonable house uh, price wise. And it, I could have uh, spent a lot more and had a lot less in Ann Arbor. So I just have a small, small commute, but, um, but I've, over the five years, uh, built up quite a, quite a lot of equipment so I can be self-sustained out here for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a great space for your work and then you also have somewhere to store it too. <laughs> cool. Well, does anyone have any last um, questions or comments for Jason? Um, I, I was curious about the, um, the, how you position the animals from the work in the Netherlands. Um, I really love making these connections between these pieces based, you know, with your process and um, the use of found objects and ready-mades and the kind of um, Baroque processes behind these very um, concise and elegant works and I was just wondering how you how you saw the, the role of the animals in your work if it, it was sort of positioned in the same place as these other objects or if it took on this other um, role for you that's a great question um, yeah I think so artists residencies are fantastic because they sort of make they force you to think differently right you don't have access to what you're familiar with in your studio uh, or the people that you usually talk to when you're thinking through ideas. So it was a, a direct response to the landscape. And it was a really, it was a fantastic experience. You know, I had um, the, the dairy farmer himself was not super interested in letting me work uh, with them. He didn't, uh, you know, one, there was a language barrier. I was in an area in colder vein uh, in the Netherlands that was very little English. So I had translators and, um, you know, I could just see in his response, like his body language, he was like, well, why, why does, what does he need a cow for? You know, I'm not going to let him borrow a cow. Um, so uh, I think it's, you know, it's not an object, but the cow was a beautiful object, right? Like it's a, it's a beautiful animal and then kind of framing it within this very specific um, cut circle, its own personal island. I get questions about whether or not you know, like they felt bad for the cow. Um, but the the law in the Netherlands was that they only had to have enough room to lunge forward and stand up. So they were kept in very cramped stalls in pretty bad conditions. So that one, that cow got a, a really nice little vacation. I took good care of her. You could see the other cattle staring at us. Like <laughs> she probably saw God. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about it maybe formally, you know, it was a beautiful location. Um, they allowed me to make this, this, you know, to dig on their property and just thinking about it as almost like a painting. The, the photography I got from it was beautiful. So, yeah. All right. Well, I think we're out of time for tonight, but thank you so much, Jason. This was awesome. We love seeing your work. And um, yeah, so I put Jason's website in the chat. So if you want to get in touch with him, please go there to do so and follow up on his work. I'm trying to open the chat. There we go. There you <laughs> go. And thanks everyone for coming tonight. Great. Thank you Thank all you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right.